Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, I am Ashley Ricamo. I work in the library, and um, some of you may know me as the Canvas support um, person. I also do instructional design support here at the library. And um, I am here today in my capacity as the digital scholarship coordinator for our new digital scholarship initiative. So today I want to sort of present a little bit of information about what digital scholarship is and how the AU library can support you um, if that is some kind of research that you're interested in. So sort of we're going to talk about the intersection between digital scholarship, qualitative research, the library, and you. Um, the point of this presentation is to give a general overview of digital scholarship options, give you an idea of what it is, and um, how it could supplement your research projects. So here is our agenda for the day. Um, we are going to talk about what digital scholarship is, um, why it's important and what its potential impacts are. We're going to talk about digital tools and qualitative research projects specifically. And um, as I mentioned, sort of with the goal of this, I want to give you a sense of the opportunities for how you can engage with digital scholarship in partnership with the AU Library. And then I'll give you some tips for getting started as well. The learning outcomes for this session are to define digital scholarship, explore the opportunities of research projects that use digital tools, and to discuss ways in which the AU Library can support digital projects. So um, because we've got a pretty big group here today, um, and I don't know individually um, your level of um, knowledge already of digital scholarship, I have a quick poll for you. So this is a Mentimeter poll. If you could use your device, um, either the laptop that you're on, or maybe if you have a phone or a tablet nearby, and go in a browser to menti.com, it'll ask you for a code. And our code is up at the top of the screen here. It's 96493925. So the question for the poll is, have you heard of digital scholarship before? And the options are, yes, I've heard of it. No, I don't know what it is. And the third option is I'm very familiar with it already. So I'll give you all a second to sort of um, fill that out. Again, you can go to menti.com and the code is 96493925. Okay, is anyone having trouble with this or? If you have a question, you can let me know or you put it in the chat. If not, I'll just go based off of what the information that I have available to me, um, which is that um, we've got one answer for no, I don't know what that is. So um, that's great. Hopefully by the end of today, um, you will be able to um, get more information about what digital scholarship is. Oh, there we go. Perfect. I don't know why that wasn't updating for me. Thank you all so much. Okay, so we've got still the majority of folks saying no, not sure exactly what that is. All right, thank you for the uh, little hiccup there. Thank you for your patience. We've got one person very familiar, three people that say they've heard of it before. Okay, so we're going to get started with our um, topic today, which is what is digital scholarship? And I've got here also, why do we care? Why is it important? Why is it something that we are interested in um, here at AU? So digital scholarship is um, the definition that we have here at AU for digital scholarship is the application of modern digital technologies to advance or supplement the traditional process of scholarly exploration, discovery, and sharing. So essentially what this is, is using digital tools to answer research questions. Um, and this could be any scholarly activity that uses a digital tool or technology in any of its stages. 
And traditionally, or usually the reason that you would use a digital tool or technology to supplement your research um, would be kind of one of three different ways. It's usually used to expand research options in terms of what you are able to do as a scholar or how you are able to um, share the research when it's completed to share your findings. So folks often make um, use of digital tools and technologies to advance conditional or excuse me, conventional methods of analysis. So if you think of something like um, statistical software or um, high performance computing, these tools make possible forms of analysis and volumes of analysis and the speed of analysis um, that wouldn't be possible um, without potentially, you know, years of work um, to do. Um, digital tools can also make certain types of research questions possible in the first place. So an example of that would be something like text mining, which is gaining in popularity. Um, that is a sort of quantitative analysis of texts. Um, and so with that, you can take a large group of texts, whether written or other styles, and what you can do with that is to take a close look at um, the different ways that communication uh, information is communicated in those texts. Um, and people can use digital tools as well to publish findings um, of their research in new digital formats. So this might look like something on the web, uh, excuse me, the slide here. Um, you have something um, combining narrative and analysis with imagery. You have some uh, kind of data visualization here on this um, middle image, or you have um, presenting research findings as part of a map. So these aren't the only options available um, in terms of digital scholarship, but this is just sort of where the um, junction between digital tools and technologies and traditional research lies. So does anybody have any questions so far? I don't see anything so far in the chat. All right, I'll keep going. So I've got some examples and some other things going on here for you too. Um, so digital scholarship has um, many different characteristics, but three of what I think are the most important are that it is creative and collaborative. Because again, you're using tools um, that are available to us now in the 21st century to look at traditional questions in new ways, or even possibly find brand new directions and brand new questions to take a look at. Um, it is collaborative and often interdisciplinary um, because when you're using some of these digital technologies, it allows for folks to work together who might otherwise not have ever had cause to work together. You know, it can bring together people from different um, departments and units on the university. And um, you may have heard of digital humanities before. So that is something that um, possibly you are more familiar with than digital scholarship. But here at AU, um, digital scholarship is open to all disciplines and all researchers, you know, faculty, staff, uh, students even. And so we are calling it digital scholarship to kind of showcase that it is for everyone here at AU. Okay, let's try the Menti um, thing again. I'll see if we can get it to kind of update in real time. That was a little tricky last time. Um, but go again to menti.com. If you still have the browser open on your other device, um, it may have a next button at the bottom of the page. Um, if not, you can refresh it and put the code in again. Um, and then this time we have an open-ended question. So you're gonna type something in response. And the question is, um, I'd like you to think about in what ways do you already engage with digital tools and technologies to pursue your research? Um, I don't want you to worry too much about whether what comes to mind for you kind of fits in that box or that definition of what digital scholarship is or isn't. Um, I just want you to think about it broadly. You know, in the last, say, 20 years, maybe 30 years, even longer, um, how has your research changed um, because of digital technologies and what kinds of technologies do you do in your, or use already in your research? So let's see if we can get that to update.
Okay, great. We've got some popping up. This is good. We've got outreach via email, right? So reaching out to people that way, um, doing interviews via Zoom. So that allows you to sort of reach out to people that you may otherwise not be able to reach. Um, we have got e-consent for online surveys. Again, that sort of online survey tool allows you to reach a lot of uh, people um, and kind of that aren't necessarily just located where you are and you don't necessarily have to go to them. Um, Mateo says in the chat, also surveys, good. All right, I've got more options for surveys here, Qualtrics surveys, Qualtrics is a great tool. And Vivo software for analysis, collaboration, and Zoom for international collaboration, good. We've got focus groups. Focus groups and in-depth um, interviews over Zoom using social media for online ethno uh, ethnography, great. AI enabled citation finders and storage and maps, good. Social media to share the findings. This one, let's expand that. We've got face-to-face -face interviews with students and qualitative COGOD labs, Qualtrics surveys, good. Excuse me. Okay, data mining, data extraction from data sources and LinkedIn to share surveys. Great, wonderful, awesome. So we've got a good mix here of um, digital, digital tools that folks are using for one aspect or another. Some folks for gathering data, um, some folks for sharing their research findings or kind of um, publicizing them, that's great. Um, so why I asked you this question um, and what I kind of hope to accomplish with this is I think it's important to make the distinction between um, web-based tools that you might use to kind of conduct your research at all, just because we are living in 2023. And then those kinds of projects and tools that can fit into the realm of digital scholarship. So um, using different tools and technologies to do your research, whether conducting that research or presenting that research in new and different ways, um, ways that go um, beyond sort of traditional or simple digital tools. So I think the key difference here is um, that you want to take your research in new directions using the tool. Um, that might be impossible even with traditional um, methods and traditional expectations. So thinking about um, you know, digital scholarship more deeply, we wanna take a look at what does digital scholarship look like? Um, so it does go beyond things like using a um, database. Um, it does uh, go beyond things like publishing your work as a PDF. Um, and what it, you're really doing here is um, you're taking your traditional scholarly exploration and using a tool to further it. So digital scholarship can look like these first three things. So answering research questions, broadening knowledge, critically investigating different ideas, furthering the scholarly conversation in your field. So those three things look a lot like traditional forms of research, which is the point I wanna make here. So um, I want to uh, make sure to stress um, that digital scholarship, even though it has a digital component to it, is still research, right? You've still got your um, analysis element. You've still got that data, that research that you're um, delving into. Where it differs is um, in that you're conducting it or presenting it in new ways. And so digital scholarship can also look like those last two points here on this slide, completing an analysis made possible by digital tools in the first place, or generating digital products to display and share your research. So it's pretty broad here. Um, but what I do want to kind of stress again, sort of the negative evidence of what digital scholarship is not, um, it is it goes beyond using those tools that are a necessary product or necessary part of doing your research in 2023 and kind of moves them into those new areas. And it is also not just making an administrative tool, maybe a database that you use to kind of organize all of your information in a way that's easier than using Excel. Um, and it's not just building a beautiful website, right? It's really, you gotta focus on that um, research analysis inquiry component. 
So here are some examples of what digital scholarship can look like. Um, it could take the form of a digital essay, exhibition, or narrative, um, where those types, all of that type of information that would typically pre be presented in an essay um, is presented digitally. Um, so typically you would see this on a website, um, but you could do it in different ways as well. It can take the form of an audio or visual video project. Um, so maybe a podcast where you're presenting um, the investigation that you did and the findings that you found. Maybe it's a documentary or, or an oral history. Um, you can um, also create digital archives or collections where you're kind of gathering up primary sources, curating them, telling the history about each of these objects and grouping them together in a collection. Um, some folks create games or other teaching resources with an interactive component where people are learning about um, your particular research topic um, in an interactive and exploratory way. It can look like social media. So we saw a number of people um, that were saying that they use social media to gather data um, or to just, you know, distribute and share the, um, their data. It can look like a, forming a digital community where people meet together um, and they are gathering information together. They're sort of um, constructing knowledge together as part of a digital community. It can look like computational analysis that takes many different forms. Um, it can look like creating a data set or an application programming interface. Um, it can look like um, creating a new tool or an interface um, where it's more about creating um, the process of how someone accesses the content than the content itself. So as you can see, um, digital scholarship incorporates a lot of different things and it is fairly broad, right? If we think back to that initial definition that is just sort of applying digital technologies and tools to research, um, you can see here how you can get such a long list of possible options and um, possible uh, outlets for your research. So I have some examples here of digital scholarship that was conducted by folks at AU. Um, to give you even more of a sense of what exactly this can look like in real time. So the first is a digital exhibition from a master's student in art history. So at the conclusion of their program, they have to create a master's thesis and they can either do a digital option or a traditional um, research paper. So this student, what they did was they um, curated and researched and produced a digital exhibition of a certain artist. Um, and so this student chose the images just like somebody who worked at a museum would do. They chose all of the different images that um, showcase the story they wanted to tell. And if you click on them, you can see um, the narrative showcasing all of the research that the student did into the artist and into the artist's inspirations and work and the um, different kinds of themes that they explored in their art. And so, yeah, we've got a comment in the uh, chat that says, this is great, I agree. I think it's a very neat idea. Um, and essentially you can kind of see what they're doing here is they're using digital tools to um, share the research that they have done about this particular artist's work. And so this is very similar to something you would see in a museum, but they're using a digital tool to um, kind of share that with a wider audience. Um, it's not just able to be shared with people who can physically be in a certain museum on a certain day. So the next um, example that I have to show you is a student who used two different digital tools as part of their digital history methods class here at AU. So the two tools that they used for their project was 3D scanning and 3D printing. And so um, this student created an exhibition on material culture um, of items that were owned by the enslaved families at James Madison's Montpellier. So um, the collection at Montpellier's museum is um, only about 1% of their whole collection. So there are a lot of um, items that are not available for public use and public research. And the student chose five of those items that are not on display. 
And they used the museum's digital uh, 3D scans to then create 3D printed tangible replicas of those items. And so what they were able to do is have that tangible replica of the item in order to do their research on it, and then also to um, kind of share during the exhibit and educate others on those items. And so they wrote a blog about it, um, and there's a short video here. I'm not going to show it because sometimes the video doesn't um, work super great through Zoom, um, but you can see their process in this um, short video. I can uh, share the link so you can do that. I'll share the link for the other one as well. And this last project that I wanted to showcase for you um, is a digital collection and archive that was done in conjunction with folks at AU um, about the AU trans experience throughout history. And so this website that they created has a timeline. You can see, you can click on any of these and be taken to a certain time where they provided a sense of the events that were happening in certain years and the history of what was going on alongside primary sources that were digitized and put into the digital collection. And so you can see here, um, they're giving access to folks by digital means um, access to people who may not be able to travel to AU to take a look at the actual physical items, they're expanding the reach of their research that they have done. Um, up here, they also have links to listen to oral history. So they interviewed folks as part of that primary source collection. Um, and you can click on any of these interviews and listen to the uh, firsthand experiences um, of people who were trans at AU throughout time. They also have a link to the full archive. So this is just sort of a highlight along the timeline. Um, this one showcases every document um, that they have digitized as part of this project. So I hope that gives you um, more of a sense of exactly what kinds of options are available to folks who wish to engage with digital scholarship at AU. Um, I would like to send you all into breakout rooms for a short while um, to think about now that you know a little bit more about what digital scholarship is and what it looks like, I'd like you to think about some benefits and challenges to doing this type of research. So think of some benefits um, of using these kinds of tools and methods, you know, what could be um, gained from doing so, and then also think of the challenges that you might encounter. So let me get these breakout rooms set up. Um, I am going to um, give you about five minutes. So take some time, introduce yourself. I'm gonna try to broadcast this slide into the um, breakout rooms as well um, so that you can um, you know, read these. Um, you do not need to have any kind of spokesperson, but we are going to do an annotation activity right after this. Um, so please think of at least a couple things that you can bring back to the group. Okay, so those are open. And you can go ahead and join and I'll get the um, sharing set up for you. I did not want to hit the eject button. I tried to get off mute. All right, welcome back everyone. I hope that was good um, that you got to, you know, in get introduced to some of your colleagues and talk a little bit about some of the benefits and potential challenges of digital scholarship. Um, I would like you, I did mention before you went in that there would be sort of a uh, product to do at the end. Um, so I would like you to take this empty slide and start filling it up with what you talked about in your groups. So you should be able to, if you have the newest update of Zoom, you should see an annotation button. It looks like a pencil in the lower left-hand corner of your screen around somewhere near where my mouse is. Does everybody see that or is it not there for you? 
It's there. Okay, perfect. So if you click on that um, pencil icon, you should get a bar that shows up um, at the top of your Zoom screen that has some different um, options. So the easiest one for this particular activity would be to click on the T for text box. Um, and that will let you, it'll give you a space where you can start typing in your answers. So I think, um, yeah, we've already got one option up here. So benefits, please, on the left. Challenges, please, on the right. And have at it. And let me know if you have any questions about how to do it. Um, you can text uh, or message me in the chat privately um, and I can help you. Yeah, we've great. We've got some great options already. Feel free to keep adding. I'll check the chat too. I see some messages there. All right, wonderful. Thank you all so much for sharing. I'm seeing it's working out okay. Um, I'm gonna go through some of these and we can talk about it a little bit. And then I've got a slide where I kind of filled out this same thing. Um, I like that um, you all have some of the same things that I wanted to mention and some things that I hadn't um, put on to mention. So this is great. Um, as far as under the benefits on the left-hand side, we've got, um, basically some comments that are can be summarized as sort of expanding the reach of your research. So reaching a wider audience, you don't have to wait for a journal publication cycle to share it. Um, so that's great. We've got um, some comments about the kind of visually appealing and how engaging it could be. Um, for people, not only your peers to engage with, um, in academia, but also potentially community members or other folks who are interested in the topic. Um, one great thing about digital scholarship is it can be both scholarship and used for teaching, right? So you've got that kind of, in some projects, you have that display element um, that can be used in teaching. For student projects, definitely you could have students um, work together in groups and um, students who are interested in developing skills beyond research and writing um, have the option to combine their research skills with artistic skills, with technical skills. That's great. Um, accessibility is a, a good thing, right? Getting your, your um, research out to different people. And um, you are able to, with a digital um, project, in some cases, access and link multiple repositories or collections at one time. 
Um, in the chat, um, we have, you can constantly update the co content, which may be true um, depending on what the project is and what its life cycle will be, which we'll get into on the challenges side. Um, and uh, right, DEAI, different, uh, getting kind of the word out of different voices, different people is also a great thing. As far as challenges go, um, you guys thought of um, a number of them, which is great. Um, we have a comment here about the research life cycle or a couple comments about the research life cycle. So how are these projects archived? How are they maintained? Um, you know, how are they hosted, right? How, where is it going to live? Um, and who is going to be able to find it? And um, who is going to be able to access it? Right, so that is a big question with digital projects. And if you think about certain things online, right, like maybe a website, you are so we are sort of used to in 2023 the idea that a website may not live forever, especially if it was older, maybe the person stopped updating it. We're sort of used to running across websites like that on occasion, where we are not used to that sort of um, attitude is with research, right? Um, you know, sometimes when you're looking at information about digital scholarship projects, they talk about a book life. Um, so when you publish a book or a chapter in a book or an article, um, it's kind of there. It's there all the time and people can access it. Um, in some cases with books, people can still access books that were published hundreds of years ago, uh, you know, if they get the right permissions and things. So with a digital project, um, digital research, that is a big question because the idea that maybe this project just lives for three years and then it's retired is sort of a strange concept in the area of research. Um, and as Liz commented in the chat too, you may be expected to keep your content of whatever research study you conduct updated. And so that is a question with digital scholarship. Um, so there's a couple comments here about, you know, how much work is involved, right? So there is a lot to learn in some cases, right? If you've never made a website before, if you've never um, worked with um, geospatial software before, or created a digital archive of your own before, you know, there's a, a big learning curve there, or there can be. Um, and so that is something to consider as well. Um, and there's a couple different comments here about, um, you know, peer review, um, you know, your tenure and promotion committees and how would these types of projects fit in with that. So that is also definitely a bigger conversation that needs to start happening. Um, a lot of different um, fields, associations have published best practices for how to evaluate this type of work, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is kind of trickle down, so to speak, to the institutions themselves and to the people that would be making these kinds of decisions. All right. And accessibility uh, over here on the right as well is it can be. So there is accessibility benefits to digital projects and there can be accessibility challenges as well, depending on what kind of um, project you produce and how it is published and how it is shared with others, those accessibility um, concerns might be challenging. All right, thank you so much. Let me clear all of this and then move on to the things that I had thought of. Um, so some of them again are related to things that you all had pointed out, right? It um, can lend itself well to community engagement, for example, because in some cases you can expand your reach. Um, you can, in some cases, more quickly um, and more easily share information um, with the people who need that knowledge. You know, whether that is, again, other researchers, whether it's your peers here at AU, whether it is wider audiences. Um, it can, as I mentioned in our definition um, piece, it can transform the possibilities for knowledge creation, preservation, and dissemination, depending on what you're trying to do and what kind of tools that you're using. Um, and what kind of research questions that you have. Um, it can encourage collaboration and build new collections, or excuse me, connections between disciplines. 
In some cases, it can increase the speed at which the work can be completed. So if you think about all the different things, computers can do a lot faster, and in some cases with more accuracy than humans can do. Um, and it also connects to AU strategic plans. So just throw that one out there. Um, it connects with the three pillars specifically of um, scholarship, learning, and community, right? Because we can, um, as somebody pointed out, it is or can be both scholarship and used for educational purposes. Um, and with that community piece, you know, you're broadening the um, scope of your work potentially or the um, broadening the amount of people who can encounter your work. Um, some challenges, many of you already brought these up. Um, the effort required to learn new tools and technology is not something to take lightly, um, depending on what you kind of project you want to do. And if you think about it, you're not only learning a new tool, you're also learning a sort uh, or a set of methods that go with a particular tool. If I want to, um, for example, um, I'm just going to point out geospatial research again. If I want to undertake a project using this kind of a tool, there are also best practices and requirements for how to set up and how to go about doing a research project of that type. Um, it's not necessarily just about learning the tool. Um, I think there also for some folks might be a temptation just to use something that is really cool, um, but it doesn't necessarily tie in correctly with the research question. Um, I think people can fall into that trap sometimes with teaching too. They just get so excited about something and want to use it. Um, and you got to really think about, does this particular tool further and enhance the research question or your research goals? And digital scholarship options, uh, tools and methods might not be properly suited for every research goal, right? Just because it exists doesn't mean everybody needs to be doing it um, by any means. And so I think that's something um, that can be challenging or definitely something to consider before starting a project as well. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? about digital scholarship, what it looks like. I can do any kind of further clarification if anyone wants um, or what its kind of benefits or, or challenges could be. All right, I don't see anything in the chat. So I'm gonna move on, but feel free to add something to the chat if you think of it later. Um, so our next section, we're going to start thinking about what kind of digital tools and methods exist and how can they be tied into research that you might be already doing? So if we think about all the different things that digital tools can do. So remember we defined digital scholarship as applying digital tools and technologies to that traditional process of research and exploration. Um, and so digital tools can be kind of included in any stage of that process. There are technologies out there that can help you extract and collect your data. They can help you analyze that data and kind of look at a thing more closely and kind of describe and understand it. There are tools out there that can help you manage and organize your data. As you might imagine, if you've never conducted a research project like this before, you end up with a lot of electronic files, right? There's data, there's content, there's potentially images, videos, all of that kind of thing, um, and need a way to store all of it. Um, there are tools and technologies out there that can help you present your analyses, analyses and present your arguments that you're trying to make. And they, there are also tools available that help you preserve the data and publications once you have completed them. So really, the, like I mentioned before, any stage of the research life cycle. So a lot of folks, when they might think about kind of technology generally, um, or different kinds of software and things might lean towards um, thinking that it's very easy to apply that to quantitative um, research approaches and methods. Um, but there are also a lot of digital scholarship tools and methods out there um, that would be able to help you with qualitative research as well. And so on this slide, there's kind of a lot, um, but I picked four different types of qualitative approaches by no means is this every kind of approach, um, but I wanted to pair it with um, some tools or methods that you could use to further that kind of analysis, um, you know, to kind of engage in a digital scholarship type project. Um, so 
with content analysis, if you are someone whose research involves looking at how concepts and ideas are communicated, um, there are certain tools that could help you with that type of research. So one of them is text mining. Text mining is taking a look at large volumes of digital content um, and kind of figuring out what's going on, right? So what are the ideas that are being communicated within this set of digital texts? Um, what are the purposes? What are the messages? What are the intended effects of these types of communication? Uh, sorry about the phone. I unplugged mine, but all the ones in the room ring at the same time. Um, topic modeling is also an option for you if you um, use this type of approach in your research. Um, essentially what topic modeling does is it is taking, again, a set of texts and looking for um, patterns. What kinds of um, words or phrases or um, things like that are co-occurring within a certain genre or within a certain um, writings about a certain topic? And then what else is going on within that topic? So this is kind of a very simple example of this. I don't know why anyone would actually do it. But for example, if you had a bunch of digitized books about cats um, and you wanted to do topic modeling on cats, you could um, do that kind of analysis and it'll pull out other topics, ideas, um, you know, phrases that are used in books about cats. And so you can then take that kind of topic of cats and expand it and see what else is going on there. So that's kind of a brief overview of what topic modeling is. And um, either of these two um, methods could be used on um, just sort of general digitized text like books and articles and newspapers and things like that. Um, they could also um, be done on digitized collections of primary sources, such like we have here um, in our, our archives and special collections um, unit in the library. Um, so if you are someone who does thematic analysis, where you're trying to take a look at um, people's experiences, opinions, views, knowledge, values, all of that kind of thing, um, and collect data from them, um, there are lots of tools. Many of you already mentioned some of these. Um, there are online survey tools that are available to you. Um, there might be interview or focus group transcripts that you could use. Um, both of these would allow you to kind of reach, extend your reach a little bit farther um, to who might be included in your analysis. Um, you could do mobile diary or journal studies. Um, I actually saw a flyer for one of these um, walking back to my office from a meeting this morning um, where folks are reacting to something and updating you, the scholar, um, through a mobile phone, um, telling you all of the information that you need to know. Um, you could also use collaborative online platforms and take a look at how people are expressing their opinions and experiences on those platforms. So somebody mentioned using social media um, to collect data. Um, oral histories could also fall in this group as well. So that was something that was popular a number of years ago and is increasing again in popularity, is really going out, um, finding the people who um, were involved with something or present when something important was happening and collecting their version of events. Um, if you are someone who is doing research with textual analysis, so taking a look at the meaning and symbolism and kind of broader context of different types of texts, text mining and topic modeling go great for that as well. You have also probably heard of close reading. You may not have heard of distant reading, um, which is kind of as it sounds. So instead of taking a very close look at a small number of texts, um, you're taking a broader look at potentially a whole genre or a whole um, collection of works by one author and um, kind of expanding the view to um, have computers analyze all of that and, and uh, pull out whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, and corpus linguistics could go with this as well. So they have been doing this sort of thing for a very long time, um, taking a look at um, figures of speech and words and how they're used and um, applied and what is 
potentially, you know, how they're set up in a sentence and that kind of a thing. Um, for discourse analysis, taking a look at how language is used to create meaning in social contexts, um, you could use a method of discourse network analysis, which really takes a look at the connections between um, different discourse communities in the online space. Um, you could do online ethnographies. Somebody mentioned this before as well, um, kind of exploring cultural practices in online um, social or digital communities. Um, and social annotation could go along here as well. So this is taking annotation, which is typically a solitary task and making it collaborative. And then you can kind of take a look and analyze all of the different views um, that were posted in that annotated text and kind of how the group um, is expressing um, meaning and um, reinforcing norms. So again, this is just a sort of a taste of options that are out there for you. Um, it is by no means exhaustive. So I apologize if your particular preferred um, mode of analysis isn't on this slide, but I was just trying to think of some of the ones that folks at AU might be interested in. So the digital scholarship presentation piece, this is what most people think of when they think of digital scholarship, I think, if they are familiar with it in any way, is sort of the um, products at the end of a research project that are um, displayed and shared digitally. So I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, conducting the research as I did on the previous slide, but we can't forget this piece either. Um, there are lots of tools and methods out there available um, for folks to share and present their, their findings as well. So some of these we kind of already talked a little bit about in the examples earlier. Um, you know, a digital scholarship project might look like any number of these things. You've got digital essays, digital storytelling. So those storytelling elements of maybe maps and timelines and things. Interactive elements or tools are always popular because then someone is taking an active role in um, exploring and growing their knowledge. Um, you could have spatial representations and maps. Uh, as a final product of a digital research, or, excuse me, digital scholarship project, any audio video projects, digital collections and exhibitions, websites and 3D printed objects. So we saw some examples of these before. So um, I would like you just to take a, a minute or two um, and reflect individually. Um, you know, we've You've got a sense now of some of the tools um, and methods that are out there and how they can be used for qualitative research projects, but I want you to try to connect them, if you can, to your own field. So take a second and think about, could any of these methods or tools fit within your field? Um, if they could be applied, how so? And then also try to think about, have you seen um, in your own research, taking a look at what your peers are doing, have you seen any of these methods or tools used in your field before? And this could be either in the kind of the tools used to conduct the research or to present the research. So just I'm gonna um, go on mute for a little while, just take a second and think about that. So um, does anyone want to share in the chat if they have um, encountered any projects like this before in their own field? And maybe the answer is no. That's entirely possible too. Okay, so Christina says, I've asked students to complete digital essays, digital stories, and create a website to collect various digital work. Okay, so that is for students. Okay, Liz also has had students create websites as part of a course. Yeah, so I think, um, 
Okay. Lynn commented that I've seen recommendations to include a QR code on poster presentations, okay, to allow for more engagement. So maybe, um, you know, they have the QR code that takes you to some kind of interactive element or a tool that you can use, or maybe a digital community. I, I went to a presentation recently where they had a QR code to join their digital community, which was kind of neat. Okay, publishing res digital research on a certain website. Okay, great. Digital stories for conferences, hoping it's more engagement or engaging. Good, great. So you can see there's a little bit of a mix here. So many people have encountered um, digital projects more with students, which I would say is not at all atypical. Um, so I have been kind of reaching out to folks who do digital scholarship at other institutions and they say there's a lot of students involved in these kinds of projects. Um, and then there are some others. Okay, yeah, Meredith um, posted in the chat as well about a project um, uh, for students with a um, survey. Okay, great. So that's an example of using digital tool to collect the data. So it's a little bit of a mix. So some some folks have encountered these kinds of projects mostly with students. Some have used them on their own already and, and maybe have seen them used elsewhere too. Thank you all for sharing who did. Um, all right, so now that we know a little bit more about what digital scholarship looks like and the options that are available, um, to kind of mix your style of research with a digital tool. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how the library can help you because that is technically why I'm here today um, in the role and the hat I have on today. So we have lots of digital scholarship related offerings in the library and have had for a good amount of time um, that you can make use of for your projects. Um, and so we are um, trying to kind of coordinate all of these services with our new initiative, and we are trying to help folks in a more intentional way. Um, we support all different types of research projects, and so really um, we just want to hear from you and um, see different ways that we can help you. So here are our current offerings related to digital scholarship in the library. Um, so we have a geospatial research lab. So if you are interested in doing analysis of geospatial data, um, our director can help you with that type of analysis, depending on the research question and the research project and the goal. Um, our director might recommend different levels of tools um, to you that might suit your project the best. Um, and then you could also use that software. Um, that we have in that lab to produce maps. So not only analyze them, but also produce them depending again on your goal for your research. Um, we have a wide variety of multimedia tools um, and production support in the library. Um, so it's anything from Kaltura, which you may be familiar with through Canvas, or you might have your students use. It's a very simple um, video creation software that's integrated with Canvas. Um, and it's really good for screen capture videos and webcam videos, and that's about all it can do. It has a very simple editing um, interface, and it everything students create or you would create with it is also auto-captioned. We also have the Simple Studio available in the basement of the library. If any of you are interested in creating a um, video project in a studio. So this would be very good for something like an oral history, or if you're interviewing somebody for a documentary or something of that nature. Um, our simple studio has all of the equipment already set up and ready to go. Um, you get a quick um, consultation and kind of quick training on how to use all of it. And then we kind of just set you loose um, and you can make audio only. We do have some faculty members who come in and create podcasts in the space because it's soundproofed. Um, and or you can create a video project. There's different backdrops. There's um, a light board in there. And <clears throat> excuse me, there's different um, options for showing something if you wanted to film yourself kind of displaying something for the camera. If you wanted to go even broader than that, um, there are a number of multimedia tools um, available for you to rent, so equipment. 
essentially. There's microphones, there's things like a GoPro, there's video cameras, there's, I believe, regular digital cameras. And those would function kind of the same as a book, right? You check it out, you take it wherever you want to take it. So you could film somewhere on campus or outside or in um, somewhere else in DC. Um, and then you bring it back when the rental period is over. So there's a lot of different layers there available to you. We also offer limited um, post-production assistance, um, mostly through kind of self-service um, guides and things like that. Um, we have a number of different platforms for digital websites and exhibitions. Um, they, those are Omika S, which is um, really good for doing kind of a digital exhibition piece like we saw the example of earlier. Um, it also is, can be good for creating different collections of items because you can input metadata for any, any image or video or um, artifact that you upload. WordPress is available to everyone through Edspace. So some of you may already have an Edspace page for your own personal, um, you know, your CV or however you might display your research on there. Um, but you can also use lots of different templates and plug-in tools on WordPress to create a more interactive website experience for someone. And then there's also Esri Story Maps. Um, that one is good for storytelling. Um, there are lots of different tools that it has available as part of its suite, um, including things like timelines and um, maps. Um, we have our makerspace, which is also in the basement of the library. And this has a 3D printer and a lot of other different kinds of equipment that you could use to make a, a tangible object with, um, as either as part of your research, like that student um, who was um, creating replicas of historical items, um, or as part of an exhibition to show people in the end kind of as a product for your research. We also offer printing and scanning services. This is sort of tangentially related to digital scholarship. We off offer um, poster printing and poster design consultations. There are also self-service scanners on the third floor of the library if you would like to come in and digitize some of your own um, documents um, for a research project. Because, um, as I mentioned before, digital scholarship, you end up with a lot of files. Um, we offer data management services on how to kind of organize and deal with all of the data. And this is technically for any research project, but it is also related to digital scholarship as well. Um, if you need assistance with finding data sets, with determining what your data should be, um, if you need assistance with um, storing or archiving any of your data or sharing it and publicizing it, you can do that too. Um, so we have a research data librarian who kind of his work touches on a lot of those different elements. And then we also have two different spaces um, where folks can um, store and preserve an archive um, their research projects. So you may have already used some of these before. So we have a digital archives and collections. Um, you can use those, of course, for your research while you are, um, you know, doing your study. You can also, in some cases, create your own digital collections with, in conjunction with our archivist. Um, and so that is also an option available to you. We can also um, provide or, or complete static archives of different websites and things like that for preservation purposes, if you're interested. Anything that is archived by the archives is kind of restricted access. Um, it is an AU uh, only audience. The institutional repository is public facing. Um, this is a repository where you can place your different research projects. Um, there are some caveats with this one. Um, you do have to have IRB approval if it is required for that particular project. Um, and it, there are copyright considerations. So you either need to be the copyright owner, you need to have permission to use whatever materials that you have used, or it has to be uncopyrighted materials. So that's sort of a lot um, of different things. I do have a QR code at the end of the presentation um, that takes you to a website where all of these different things are listed. So you don't necessarily have to try and memorize all of them right now.
So there are numerous ways that the library can support you. Um, we offer all of these services and all of these tools to folks, but we can go a little bit farther with helping you with your digital research projects as well. Um, we would be able to um, consult with you to help you identify the tools that best match your research question and your project goals. Um, our librarians and our digital scholarship experts in the library do this all the time. Um, we could help you decide on the best ways to add digital components to your research if that's something you're interested in, because remember the research question is going to guide the tool that you choose. Um, you can learn how to use digital tools on offer from the library. Um, so we do offer currently some limited support um, and training on how to use these different software things. And we're going to try to expand our workshop offerings in the future as well to get more groups of people kind of up to speed on the basics of, of a lot of the different tools that are available. In some cases, um, we can help you locate digital tools that are freely available online. So you may come in and um, want to do a certain type of project, and it turns out that maybe a freely available tool not necessarily purchased by the library could be the best one for you. And so our staff can help you do that as well. Um, we can help you acquire specific data sets. Um, with different limitations, of course, um, but if you're looking for a certain kind of data, either we maybe already have access to it or our research um, librarian could help you find it. Um, we can also help you create data management plans for all of the digital data files and content that you might um, end up with at the end of a digital research project. And we can host and archive your digital projects again um, it's that's sort of a project by project basis, um, depending on your needs and what your project is and um, what it would end up looking like. So um, because our initiative is kind of new, right? So our effort to bring together all of these different kinds of services and support um, so that we can more intentionally support faculty with their, res their digital research projects um, there are some things that the library currently can't provide. This is mostly related to resources at the current moment. Um, so I do want to be clear about those. So I have this slide as well. Um, right now, we can't offer detailed advice on qualitative methodologies, but there is good news um, that CTRL does a little bit of this um, already. So you could make an appointment with Tiffany um, in CTRL. Um, who can provide some consultations depending on availability on those types of methodologies. Um, we currently, I know I mentioned um, text mining before, um, that is something that a lot of folks are interested in, but we currently um, cannot support text mining methods or tools. It is something we are looking into for the future, but right now um, we don't have that kind of support. But again, silver lining here, there are some other workarounds for you. So text mining is possible with R. Um, I know that Eric in CTRL has done a workshop previously about that and it was recorded. So that is um, something that you could explore to, to learn how to do. Um, and that R is a freely available tool for you. Um, AU also has access to the Hathi Trust collection of um, digitized books. And um, they do offer, as part of your AU um, subscription, access to the Hathi Trust Research Center. And there are some limited um, text mining tools um, available to you within that Research Center website um, that you could do some kind of text mining analyses on any of the digitized text within the Hathi Trust collection. So, um, it's a little limited because it is just that collection, but it is, you know, the benefit is it is a very large collection at the same time. So you could poke around in there and see if there's anything that could be useful to you if you're interested in experimenting with text mining, um, and then use the Hathi Trust Research Center to do that analysis. And that is um, something that the AU library subscribes to for you, so that is um, free and available for you to use. Um, currently at the moment, we can't offer large scale digitization of any text or media or other items that you may have. Um, I did mention that 
those there are self service scanners in the third floor of the library if that is something that you would like to have done. Um, but that's not something that our archives can currently support. Um, they are doing a lot of their own digitization projects. Um, but this may be something that we could look into in the future, just currently, it's unfortunately not something that we could help with. Um, and currently at the moment with digital scholarship projects, we can't um, support product development. So if you wanted to create a new tool or an interface or a game or something like this, um, using your research, um, we can't necessarily be involved in the creation of those prototypes, doing the user testing and that kind of thing. So we are willing and available to support you and consult with you for almost every other stage of any kind of digital project. Um, but that one is not some, something that we have the resources and staffing to um, help with right in you know this this year. All right, with that said, I wanted to also provide to you some information about how to get started with a digital scholarship project. So um, if you are wanting to get started and, and consider doing a project like this of your own, I would suggest that you follow steps like this. So I would suggest starting out with the explore stage. Take a look at um, your field in particular and take a look at some of the tools available to you at the library and try to figure out what are other folks in your field doing? How are they doing it? What methods do they use? What products are they producing? Really take a look at what's already out there um, and try to get some ideas about what you might wanna do. It can really help to expand your knowledge of digital scholarship and how to go about a project in your field specifically. So you got started today, you took the first step to learn a little bit about what digital scholarship is. And if you're interested in continuing with it and learning more about it, it's a great place to start is with just taking a look at what other folks are doing and how they're doing it in your particular field. And then you would contact us. Um, we really encourage you to get started um, you know, consulting with the library as early in your project as possible. This is more important than it sounds um, up front. So, but sometimes it can happen that someone decides they want to do a type of digital project and they just start going on it. And they don't necessarily always know that they're going too far down the kind of wrong path, so to speak. And then by the time they do contact the library, it can in some cases be too late for us to help to kind of course correct for that particular project. So I really encourage you to contact the library as early in the stage as possible. Um, we can um, consult with you, help you design the project. And in some cases, depending on the needs of your project or your wishes, we can continue consulting with you throughout that um, research project up until the creation stage. So some questions to ask yourself with digital scholarship projects. Um, I mentioned some of these before. You really do want to think about how the tool or method that you picked fits in with your research questions and goals. Um, you want to also think about how that particular project aligns with relevant practices in your field, because all of the research methods that you use as part of your individual field um, are still going to be there. They're still going to be relevant with a digital project as well. So you want to take a look at what you're trying to do and how you're trying to incorporate digital technologies and make sure it still aligns with the kind of larger context and traditions of your field. Um, you want to make sure, remember, all digital scholarship projects have that scholarship and analysis piece. So you want to make sure that the project you're proposing or thinking about furthers the scholarly conversation. Um, and then also take a second and think about what's the clearest way to communicate the findings. If you're going to try something new, do you want to create a digital essay or do you want to create a video? Do you want to create potentially a map or do you want to create a game? Um, you know, thinking about that too before, um, as you get started. If you think of these questions before you get in contact with the library, this can really help us help you um, and kind of narrow down the design of your project and the um, methods you might want to choose. All right, so and some other considerations here, I already mentioned involving the library early. 
Other folks mentioned this as a potential benefit of digital scholarship earlier is that your audience can in some cases be very wide. So you do want to consider that you are producing your research for a certain audience, which is largely other researchers, um, but there will be in some cases other people that encounter your research. And so you do wanna try um, in all the ways possible to keep those other folks in mind too, who might encounter your project. Um, you wanna remember standards for the tool. Um, so for example, if you wanted to create a digital collection, um, there are certain guidelines and requirements for doing that sort of a thing that you want to be familiar with before you get started. You wanna keep accessibility requirements in mind. For example, if you're building a website, you wanna make sure that it is completely accessible to those who may require screen readers or for folks who need um, high contrast or things like that. There's copyright considerations, which I mentioned before. You have to either be the owner, use uncopyrighted material, or you have to get um, the rights to actually use some of these images and things that you choose. Um, data storage and preservation is always um, an important consideration. That's something that we can help you with, um, you know, in the library. And then remember, as one of the challenges, many folks brought up this ongoing maintenance of the project. So thinking about, you know, will content need to be updated? And if so, who is going to do it? And when are they going to do it? You know, how often? Um, other things, you know, for example, if you are hosting the digital project somewhere. So on some server or some website, can you keep it there for a long period of time? Or do you have to move it to a third party tool? Do you have to pay for that tool? So these I know can be overwhelming if you're just in the beginning stages, but this is another reason why we at the library are here. Um, we can in some cases help guide you on some of these issues. Okay, so I have talked for a good long time. Um, I want to give you all a chance to kind of digest um, this presentation. So at the beginning with our poll, many of you said that you were kind of new to the world of digital scholarship and you hadn't heard a ton about it. Um, and so I would like you to get a chance to think a little bit about your own current work. So you have reflected a bit before on um, your field, and what other folks might be doing, where have you encountered digital scholarship? Um, now I'd like you to think about your own work. Um, you know, do you have a research question that could be furthered with a digital tool or method? Do you maybe have a project um, that you could present in a digital way? What digital tools or methods for presentation could maybe add something new to your most recent project? So I'm going to send you out into the breakout rooms again to just kind of chat it out with your peers. Um, you know, fairly low stakes. Um, I'm going to, let's see, move people around a little bit. And then I'll open these up. All right. Um, I'll let you in there for maybe five to seven minutes and then we'll basically be done. So I'll see you soon. <laughs> 